online. So I'm now going to introduce our first speaker, Sir Harry Burns, who probably doesn't need a lot of introduction because you'll often have seen him on television or at various conferences. He was um, direct, well, he started off life as a surgeon and had a revelation when he realized that just operating on people was not the way or the only way to improve health. And really he wanted to look at that much bigger picture and look at prevention and look at the reasons that people in disadvantage were suffering much poorer health than those who were better off. And that's what stimulated him to go into public health. And he reached the pinnacle of that as chief medical officer and now as a professor at um, Strathclyde. And I, um, I usually hate being on a platform with, with Harry because I usually speak after him and it's a really hard act to follow. <laughs> um, or, or he says, I can't make that conference, could you do it for me? So you're always a sort of slight disappointment when you stand up. So it's nice to be able to be chairing it and I'm introducing him. Um, so I'm going to now pass over to Harry for his presentation. Thanks, thanks, Linda. You're never a disappointment. Come on. <laughs> so I've been speaking a lot about ACEs over the past few years. And I apologize in advance to those of you that have seen the slides before and so on. But what I want, the message that I think is important to get across today is that what ACEs do is they tell you about the context within which children and families live. And if we're going to do something about it, it's that broad context that we have to think about. My concern is that, oh, ACEs are bad things happening to children, therefore it's a matter for the police. Well, sometimes it is. But if it gets to that point, as a system, we've failed. Adverse childhood, and I've got adverse childhood events there because I couldn't get experiences in, but... Um, <laughs> Technically, adverse childhood experiences. The study here started off, it emerged from a study of obesity, would you believe? The Kaiser Permanente Health System round about the early 90s had a process for tackling obesity. And what they found was there were significant numbers of dropouts from this process. And they started to investigate what was it about the individuals that were dropping out, the individuals that weren't really engaging with improving, with, with messages to improve their health and well-being. And what was common was the prevalence of adverse experiences in their early life. These nine different types of adverse experience, different types of neglect, abuse, different types of parental absence through being in jail, through mental illness and so on. And they started to look at what the impact of those adverse experiences were on those individuals as they grew into adulthood. And what they found was very significant. For example, four or more adverse events in a child's life meant they were eight times more likely to become alcoholics than if they had none. About 10, 12 times more likely to, to be using narcotics and so on. Boys who experienced physical violence at the hands of an older male, eight times more likely to engage in partner violence when they grew up, four times more likely to be arrested for carrying weapons. So the outcomes weren't just health outcomes, they were social outcomes in the very broad sense. They meant that something was happening to these people as a result of their experiences in early life that were leading to very bad things. And when you looked at the pattern of morbidity that they identified, the blue bars here on the left-hand side are slight increases in the risk of heart disease and cancer, but huge increases in the risks of problems associated with drug and alcohol consumption, mental health problems, suicide and so on. And then, if you look at the pattern that we discovered, colleagues in Glasgow discovered about the so-called Glasgow effect, what was happening, and I hate that term, okay, but that's what they named it as, the pattern of increased morbidity in Glasgow compared to what we saw in cities like Liverpool and Manchester, that's what you get. Slight increased risks in death from 
heart disease and cancer, but significant increased risk in death from drugs, alcohol, suicide, violence. So there was something happening in West Central Scotland in people that seemed to be associated with chaotic early life. And uh, Alistair Leyland from Glasgow University began to tease this out because when we talk about health inequalities in our society, we think, well, it must be due to the fact that poor people are more likely to die of heart disease and cancer. Yeah. But what causes heart disease and cancer? Well, it's smoking, it's bad diet, all this kind of stuff. Well, actually, when you look at what the drivers of inequality are, and Alistair did this in a very clever way, he split the population into five-year age bands and he looked at the inequality and in death rate across each of these five-year age bands. So you see here the blue bar on the left, that's the mort annual mortality rate, 1,600 deaths per 100,000 population in the most affluent 20% of the population in that male 65 to 69 age group, all the way down to the right-hand bar, which is almost twice the risk of death. Okay, Now, the clever thing Alistair did then was to reduce all the data on that slide down to a single number, which he could then plot on a graph. And you do that by subtracting the best from the worst and dividing by the mean. And you come up with a number that reflects the inequality slope. Okay, The steeper the slope, the bigger that number. So there you've got a 45 degree slope, and the number, the slope index of inequality is just round about 1. You do that across the age range and you plot it like this, <coughs> and you see that it's young people in this study. This is, this is death rates round about 2002, 2003. The inequality slope was shooting upwards in the teenage years and is at its highest in the 20s and 30s and starts to come down in 45, 50. Now, those aren't the people who are dying of heart disease and cancer. So what were they dying of? So the next clever thing Alistair did was he started to plot causes of death and how they contributed to inequality. The graph in the middle there is heart disease, ischemic heart disease. That's the pattern of death by deprivation uh, quintile. And you can do that across the age range. And you can see that heart disease barely contributes to inequality at all. It happens at an older age group, and it's a relatively minor contributor. And it happens at the point where the inequality index is falling. So what is it that's causing that big bulge in the early working age people? It's drugs, alcohol, suicide, and violence. The pattern already identified as causing excess mortality in West Central Scotland. So what we're seeing and what we, you know, we beat ourselves up in Scotland because we're very unhealthy and everyone assumes, the newspapers assume it's because we smoke too much and we drink too much and so on. Well, we actually do drink too much, that's true. But in international smoking leagues, Scotland is not anywhere near the top. The basic driver of our health inequalities, what's happening in young working age people. And it seems to be associated with this pattern of ACEs. If you look, in fact, at the life expectancy trend in Scotland, this is data, data from 16 Western European countries going back 160 years. And Scotland, for most of that 160 years, the dark line in the middle, Scot Scottish life expectancy has always been in the middle of the age, uh, the middle of the European range except for the last four or five decades. And if you look at the rate of growth in life expectancy in the richest 20% of the population, those of us who are in work, who are earning money and, and so on, have done pretty well. We've increased our life expectancy better than the European average. But that's the pattern of life expectancy in the poorest 20% of the population. And you can see that that widening gap over the past four or five decades has dragged the average down. So Scotland's poor health is a reflection of what's going on in the poor. 
And if you think back, well, what happened in the 1950s and 60s to produce this bulge in the 30s and 40s and now? Well, two things happened in West Central Scotland. First of all, mass unemployment amongst blue-collar workers. The shipyards, the steelworks, the locomotive works, they all closed down. And jobs that gave men purpose and meaning and status in their communities disappeared. And while the same thing happened in other cities in the UK, places like Manchester got, and Liverpool got car factories, they got consumer electronics and so on, West Central Scotland didn't get any of that. So the jobs disappeared, and at the same time, the housing changed. This is a picture of the Gorbals in the 19th century. And what your eye is drawn to there is not the housing, it's the community. It's the people out in the streets. It's the social cohesion you can see in that picture. Adults out, children out. They're looking after each other. Picture of Bridgeton Cross, a space where people would come together on big events, New Year and so on. And it was a space created precisely for that purpose. The glue was often the women who, if a young mother was struggling with bringing up children, the older women would be there to help give support. But in the 1950s, in Glasgow certainly, the city engineer, one Robert Bruce, decided all of that had to change. And indeed, the housing was way beyond uh, being fit for purpose by then. But his plan was to create more livable housing, like that. What Jimmy Reid, the trade union leader, many years later was to describe as filing cabinets for people. So the social cohesion that existed around the tenements was just blown apart. People were decanted into these places. They were sent to Easter House, where there were 30,000 homes and no schools, where they would go to East Kilbride or the New Towns, Cumbernauld, Dervin or whatever. And the social cohesion, the friends that they'd had for many years, they never saw again. And at the same time, unemployment rocketed. So what you found was disruption to the social fabric. And what we're seeing 30, 40 years later are the children born at that time having high risks of mental health problems, alcohol, violence, deaths. Are the two things linked? Well, an interesting thing is happening in the United States. Angus Deaton, who is a Nobel Prize winning economist, has published this data, the pattern of what he calls deaths of despair. What he has noticed is since 2000, there has been an, a 200% increase in deaths amongst white 50 year olds, blue collar workers, non college educated men. And those deaths are due to drugs, alcohol, and suicide. This pattern where he's, the red line is increase in white, non-Hispanic 50-year-olds compared to what's happening in other countries. And the interesting thing is he's gone on to map that increase in mortality against the counties that voted for Donald Trump in the recent election. <laughs> and they match completely. What you've found is the despair that means they turn away from conventional political parties. And what we're seeing in Italy, what we're seeing in Germany, what we're seeing in Eastern Europe, this is very dangerous. We're beginning to see the rise of alternative, you know, extremist parties. So the economics that has driven inequality that has driven, you know, the 1% of people at the very top owning more wealth than the bottom 50% is causing some very serious fractures in our society. And we're going to have to start repairing that. And I would suggest that it, the really important place to start is with the children, with the families, because we can do that.
If you look at what the NSPCC has talked about in terms of the way we focus our attention on child neglect and abuse, we tend to focus it at the apex of that pyramid. The stories of a child dying because of neglect or abuse, you know, it fills the newspapers for days and witch hunts, you know, who's at fault, who can we blame, all this kind of stuff. The focus is at the top of that pyramid, but as you move down and you begin to see the numbers change, instead of a few dozen at the top of real tragedies, you begin to see the tens of thousands of neglect offences, the cases of people phoning up the, the NSPCC helplines and so on, 30, 40,000 a year, the 40,000 who are looked after because of neglect. And then at the very bottom, you've got the hundreds of thousands of kids who experience some kind of neglect as a result of the context in which they're living. Abusive parents who probably were abused themselves, the intergenerational cycle, the neglect because of poverty. So the distribution is at the bottom, but the focus is at the top. And what we need to do is refocus on the bottom of that. Because we get in there, we stop a lot of the bad things happening at the top. Mark Bellis, good colleague of ours, and you'll be hearing more about Mark, I think, because he's now working in Wales, but when he worked in the northwest of England and began to look at the pattern of childhood experiences, adverse childhood experiences, the other point to recognise, it's not something that's concentrated at the lower end of the social scale. That happens right across the social scale. There is a slight increase in the trend of neglect and, and adversity, child maltreatment, as you go down the social scale, but it's by no means absent in the affluent areas. So we cannot turn our back. We can't say, OK, this is Lindsay or it's, you know, Newton Merns or whatever, therefore we can ignore this. It happens everywhere. And if you look at the future adversity that you see, the future, the adverse outcomes that you see here, by getting it right, we can reduce levels of really problematic stuff later on. I mean, smoking. I mean, how many years, how many smoking cessation campaigns have we run over the years? Actually, if people don't care because their lives have been shattered early on, you can talk to them till they're blue in the face. They're not going to give up smoking. And this is exactly what they discovered in California when they started the ACES study. People <coughs> didn't care if they were fat. A whole range of adverse outcomes that cost a lot of money that we should be worried about. The other thing that Mark showed was the risk of chronic disease increases dramatically with four or more adverse events. What you've got here is the proportion of individuals not diagnosed with a major disease. And that proportion increases, sorry, that proportion decreases as you get older, obviously, obviously chronic disease is older. But it, the proportion of people with chronic disease doubles by the time you reach 65. About 30% of the population, the, the, the pale line at the top, are the people who have had no adverse experiences, and the dark line at the bottom is the people who have had four or more adverse experiences. They are twice as likely to have heart attacks, strokes, respiratory disease. So it's costing the health service significant amounts of money, apart from anything else. So if we're going to manage health in its very broadest sense, the sort of health promotion that we did many years ago happens to the right-hand side of all of that, or you know, it's been moving over the years to the left-hand side. But if we get into the stage of mother and infant, if we get to the stage where Pregnant women are supported to give up smoking, where they're taught about attachment, when they're taught about how to manage 
difficult children and all this kind of stuff, where they begin to learn how to be good parents. And I have to say, out of all the projects I've visited and so on, you don't find parents who actually want to be bad parents. They just don't know how to be good parents. And it's supporting them to understand that how they manage difficulties, how they, con how they express consistency in, in supporting their children, teaches those children that life is manageable themselves. So getting in at the left-hand side of that graph really stops bad things happening. And the, the ACES study in California has calculated that one year's worth of life out of adverse events in, in the United States brings with it a lifetime cost of $124 billion dollars in terms of costs of looking after the kids when they're taken into care, costs of health care for those kids, costs of imprisonment when they go to jail, because most many of them do, and also the fact that they will never work, so they don't pay taxes. Now, in Scotland, pro rata, that's about £1.8 billion. So the kids who were born in 1960, let's say, you know, 55, 56 years on, that cohort of children, if the, the, if the prevalence of ACEs is the same in Scotland as it was in the California study, they already cost us about £1.5 billion. And the kids born in 1961, nearly £1.5 billion. The kids born in 1960, so it ratchets up. So the impact on the economy is huge. But that's not the reason to be worried about it. The reason is one of justice. It's one of, you know, concern for defenseless young babies. No baby should be born to suffer that type of life course. So I would argue this is an issue of social justice and we need to do something about it. Now, a couple of years ago, I was involved in, in this thing, the Minsk Declaration. I tell you, Minsk is one of the nicest cities I've ever been in. It was razed to the ground during the Second World War. And when they rebuilt it, the one planning rule they put in place was when the planners wanted to build buildings, they insisted that the street in front of the buildings had to be twice the width of the height of the buildings. So you get these huge, broad avenues and so on, and it's an absolutely beautiful city, but that's a wee travel log. I'm, <laughs> I'm traveling too much, obviously, but if you ever get a chance to go to Belarus, do it. The Minsk Declaration talks about a life course approach, and it talks about acting early. And the first line in it, it says, minimize childhood exposure to poverty and health inequalities. The first line isn't minimize ACEs, it's minimize exposure to poverty, because poverty drives a lot of the parental concern that explodes in domestic violence and mental health problems and so on. And then you've got these other things, equal opportunities for social participation, vaccination coverage, reduce exposure to intrauterine pro nutritional problems, etc. Minimise adverse childhood experiences, optimise cognitive development. So it's a whole context thing. What we've been doing with the Early Years Collaborative has been very significant in contributing to this, but we need to refresh that and continue to do it and do more of it. Act appropriately during life's transitions. So that's about supporting families to build parenting capacity, support breastfeeding, which builds attachment and so on. Focus on healthy adolescence, building resilience through adolescence, etc. So think about the life course, think about the social context that children are living. And one of the things that certainly I'll be mentioning on Monday when we talk to the ministers is we need to use all the data that we've got across health care, social care, education, police. We need to bring all of that together to begin to build a picture of where families are struggling. 
when some catastrophic incident happens, you always find, well, a teacher knew there was something not quite right there, and there was a social worker involved, and then maybe the GP was a bit concerned, and the health is through We need to bring all of that together. But critically, we need to respond appropriately and considerately. We don't bring in and rattle cages. We support, we ask, what is it you need? What is it you need to get your life back on track so you can look after your children? So my plea would be, let's be supportive rather than damaging to relationships within families. What we think, what I think we're seeing in Scotland is an intergenerational cycle where chaotic early years in the 50s and 60s led to a group of people Young, children, young kids with mental health problems, badly behaved at school, failed at school, got into trouble, sent to jail. And I would go to Parliament and talk to young boys who were just about to get out. And you'd say, well, what are you going to do when you get out? I've got a criminal record. I'll never get a job. So what are you going to do? Well, I'll sit at home, I'll watch telly, and I'll drink. Loss of self-esteem, loss of self-efficacy. What they never figured at that point was the girlfriend would get a baby and the baby's brought into a chaotic home and the cycle continues on to the next generation. We've got to support these young people in ways that give them that sense of self-efficacy and allow them to take control. So final slide. Just last night, going through my email and I get regular emails from the Brookings Institute in, in uh, Washington that does a lot of stuff on social and economic determinants of health. And this was the article they had on their website last night. Low-income young adults in Peru show the effects of hope and life outcomes. They've been teaching young people in really, really deprived situations to have hope for the future. And suddenly things are beginning to change. And I'll just finish with a, one last story. I once went to visit a project that was working over a week with 10 kids that had been referred by their social workers aged 8 to 10. They had real problems. And what they were doing was they were teaching these kids to have hope. Over the course of the week, they were getting them to envision what they, were going to, what they wanted to be when they grew up. And day one, they were building a papier-mâché figure and they were moulding it into what they wanted to be when they grew up. So the boys wanted to be footballers, so they were all moulding their figures into footballing poses and the girls all wanted to be pop stars, so they were all doing this. But there was one wee boy in the group who for the first hour hid under a table. He wouldn't come out. And then for the second hour, he was persuaded to come out, but he stood in the corner. If anyone went near him, he tried to kick them or punch them. What was that wee boy's home life like? So for the third hour, he began to engage. And by the end of the third hour, we were all sitting in a circle on the floor. And the guys were saying, OK, we've got these figures now. <clears throat> I'm going to go around, and I want you to stand up and just show me the pose you want me to, to mould this figure into. And this wee boy was sitting next to me, and I felt him stiffen at this point. He said, I'm too shy. I can't do that. So I said to him, well, that's OK. You tell me what you want to do, and I'll stand up and do it for you. OK. So he went round the room, and he came to him last. And they said, right, John, what figure do you want? I felt him stiffen. And he stood up, and he did it. Of course, of three hours... That wee boy went from hiding under the table to being able to engage. That's what we need. That's how we need to do it. We need to work in ways that take <coughs> kids from these horrible situations and turn them into engaged individuals who have hope. So go on to the Brookings Institute and read that story. The challenge here is not to well, it is to prevent ACEs, but it's to give families hope that they can grow and develop and produce good outcomes for their kids. Thanks very much.